I loved working at the old folks' home. It was sometimes stressful, and I really didn't like changing the bedpans, but most of my job was actually pretty fun. I had a real rapport with the old ladies here. They called me Howdy Doody because of my red hair, and a few of them even thought that I was their grandson, so they treated me extra nice. Unfortunately, they'd been understaffed lately, which meant that twice a week, I had to also work the night shift. I hated the night shift more than anything. I'd rather change a hundred bedpans than to have to spend all night at that place. They kept all the lights off except a single lamp at the front desk, and all I had to do was sit there all night long, check the rooms every hour, and call an ambulance if there were any medical emergencies. It might not seem too bad, aside from the sheer boredom of it all, but you don't know what this place is like. It's creepy. I mean, I'm a brave guy. I took care of myself and everything, but when I'm at Sunny Glen after hours, I feel like I'm six years old again. The building is over a hundred years old, so it's constantly creaking and setting. And since we were surrounded by forested area, I always see the silhouettes of animals walking through the windows. They're always out there, skittering around. Despite my nerves, I never really had a problem during the night shift until about a month ago. It was a Saturday, and I'd been called in last minute because my coworker Dan had just been fired for stealing medications. Things were normal at first. All the residents had taken their meds and gone to sleep, and I was up at the front desk checking my phone. Out of nowhere, I heard a door slam. I ran over and saw Doris, one of our residents, standing in the hallway. She was trembling and her eyes were wide. I approached slowly, afraid that she might do something to hurt herself. I asked her what was wrong and she mumbled, he's outside, he's after us. If this had happened during the daytime, I would have assumed that Doris was just having some dementia related episode, but this was the night shift and my heart started thudding in my chest. Wait right here, I told her. I slowly walked into her room, staring out the window. A cluster of trees was right outside. I waited, watched, and jumped back when I saw a figure race through the shadows. It didn't look like an animal. It looked like a person, a man. I latched the lock on the window and then raced back into the hall. Okay, I think I saw him, I told Doris. Wait right here, I'm gonna call the police. I started heading towards the front desk, but Doris grabbed me by the back of the shirt and pulled me backwards. She'd never done anything like that before. She was a kooky old lady, but she wasn't violent. Doris, I told her, let me grab the phone. Somehow she looked different than she had just a minute before. Something changed inside of her. With a surprising strength, she grabbed my shoulders and spun me around before I could do anything. I tried to gently push her away, but she wasn't stopping. I had to shove her back. She just laughed. I spun around and raced down the hall, but all around me, more doors opened. Greta, Maria, and Linda stumbled out of their rooms. They were all dressed in their pajamas, like Doris, but their eyes were wide and crazed. Greta grabbed my arm. I tried to keep going, but Maria stood in front of me, blocking my way. Look, it's Howdy Doody, she screamed. More doors were opening, and more old women came out. Something was really wrong. What had gotten into all of them? I tried to walk around Maria, but she kept blocking me like some football player. Linda, a very large woman, who had always been kind to me, wrapped her arms around and... What are you doing? Come here, howdy doody, she said. You know my husband was a redhead too. I pushed her against the wall and ran. I dove around Maria and made it out of the hallway just as more doors were opening. 
It seemed like all the residents were awake now, and they were all stumbling towards me. The whole building filled with their laughter. In seconds, I reached the front desk and grabbed my phone. With trembling fingers, I unlocked the screen and called 911. As it was ringing, I looked around. The women were still coming. I also noticed that the door to our medicine closet was wide open. Someone else was here. A police dispatcher answered, and I told her to send as many people as they had. She asked me about the nature of the emergency, but I didn't know how to say it. None of this made any sense. Th th there's been an attack, I finally said and hung up the phone. As the women kept giggling and walking towards me, I headed towards the medicine closet. Whoever was there, maybe they could explain what was going on. I could hear someone inside, rifling through the shelves. Hello? I said. Behind me, one of the women called out. Hey, howdy doody. Come over here. Yeah, cutie, another one said. Whoever was in the closet froze in place. I could see his outline, but he wasn't moving. Then, slowly, he stepped into the light. Dan? I whispered. Dan was dressed in all black, a leaf stuck to his sweater. He must have snuck inside from out of the woods. He was the figure that Doris spotted earlier. He looked at me, his dark eyes angry, accusing. You took it all, he said. Took what? My personal stash, he said as he held up an empty yellow pill bottle. I was confused. That wasn't his. That was the bottle of sleeping pills I had to give to all the residents. Dan, I said slowly. What are you doing here? You were fired. Yeah, he said, for switching out prescriptions. But it wasn't my fault. I just needed to make a little extra money. And now you... He stepped closer. You wasted my whole stash. That's when I realized that the sleeping pills I'd given to all the ladies weren't really sleeping pills at all. They were something else. Something Dan had been hiding. Oh God. All these women were high on those pills? Dan, what was in the bottle? He rattled off some medical name I didn't recognize. And when he saw that I didn't know what he was talking about, he added, You know, Mexican love pills. And right as he said it, the women had reached us. I felt hands grab me in every direction. They were on me now, giggling, pulling at my shirt and hair. They were all so strong, even the ones propping themselves up on the walkers. Dan watched as I struggled to free myself. He waved once and ran towards the front door. He knew he was going to get away with it, to leave me here, but he wasn't looking where he was going and collided with a policeman who had just walked inside. The cop grabbed Dan and cuffed him. The other officers came over and helped separate the mob. For the next few minutes, I watched as a flurry of policemen tried to calm down a bunch of elderly women who wouldn't stop. Eventually, the ambulance arrived and administered shots that seemed to counteract whatever medication they were all on. Dan, of course, was arrested, and thankfully none of our residents suffered any injuries from the chaos. I still work at Sunny Glen, but I told my boss from now on, I don't work the night shifts. Just gotten out of nursing school this spring, excited to start my first job at the small hospital just outside of our town. I lived in a very rural area in northern Arizona, so the hospital was usually pretty quiet, especially at night. As the new nurse on duty, I often had to take the night shift. I never had a problem with it. In fact, I enjoyed the peace and quiet, and the patients who were awake at those hours often had some interesting stories to tell. It really was a good gig. At least... That's what I thought. I had no idea that this night would be the very last night I worked at this place. 
I had just clocked in, and the head nurse, Margaret, filled me in on the patients. There were only three of them that night, all recovering from post-op. I made my rounds as usual, introducing myself to each of the patients. One was an older man who'd gotten his hip replaced. The second was a middle-aged woman who was so looped out on pain meds that she barely acknowledged me. They both seemed normal, business as usual. When I got to the third patient, a younger man named Paul who'd just gotten his tonsils out, I started getting a strange feeling. Paul seemed nice and everything. He asked for a popsicle, but otherwise seemed to be friendly and low maintenance. But there was just something about him, something that made me distrust him instantly. By about two in the morning, I looked around for Margaret, but she wasn't there. She must have been on her break. By then, the first two patients were asleep, but I could still hear Paul in his room singing quietly to himself. It sounded like some old folk song from centuries ago, the kind of song that a young person like Paul would never sing. I entered his room to see how he was doing. Paul sat on his bed. I tried to tell him that he needed to lie back down, but he just ignored me. He kept on singing, looking straight into the shadowy corner of the room. I figured he hadn't heard me, but he really needed to get some sleep, so I walked over and I gently placed my hand on his shoulder. Still not turning towards me, he whispered, Just let me finish singing her this song, okay? I'm almost done. Her? I asked. There was no one else in the room. Her! He said, pointing toward the dark, empty corner. Through my training, I knew that if patients ever showed signs of psychosis, I'd need to report to the doctor so that he could handle it. But there weren't any doctors here, and I didn't know where our head nurse was. I'd have to deal with this myself. Figured I had to be as gentle as possible. And what song are you singing? I asked. He turned to look at me now, and I could see that his eyes were unfocused. I knew he was on some heavy pain medicine, but... Those eyes didn't look like they were sleepy. They looked unhinged. It's the song she heard on the day she died, he said. I very quickly pulled my hand away from his shoulder. I had no idea what to tell him, but I knew I wasn't equipped to handle something like this. I needed to get out of that room and talk to Margaret. Okay, I said. I'll let you get back to your song, but after that you really should get some rest. He giggled. I started backing out of the room, looking at the patient and the shadowy corner. Before I left, though, I realized that there was something strange in that room. The corner was covered in a shadow, but I couldn't tell where the shadow came from. The lights were in the center of the ceiling, but there weren't any objects nearby to cast a shadow like that. And then I saw the shadow move. It expanded its edges becoming clearer, and I swear to you that it looked like the outline of a person sitting cross-legged on the floor. I ran out of there as fast as I could. Margaret was back at the front desk, casually scrolling through her phone. She looked up at me, slightly annoyed at the interruption, and asked if everything was okay. I couldn't tell her that I'd seen a shadow, because she would have thought I was crazy. Instead, I told her that Paul was showing signs of psychosis, and I wanted her to check on him. She huffed loudly. I'll be right back, she said, and trudged towards Paul's room. I could still hear the faint echoes of Paul's song. I waited in the empty main room while Margaret dealt with the patient. My heart was racing, and I felt like a total idiot for getting scared about nothing. Paul was just a normal guy on some medication. The shadow was just a shadow. There was absolutely nothing wrong in that room. Then I heard a single scream, Margaret's, and I ran back toward the door. I paused outside for a few seconds, struggling to keep my emotions in check, and I slowly entered the room. Paul was still sitting on his bed. His song was over, and he just stayed there, quiet and motionless. I couldn't see his face because he was still staring at the corner. I didn't see Margaret anywhere. Paul, I said, slowly approaching. Paul, is everything okay? Yes, he said without turning. As I got closer, I saw that the shadow had darkened even more. Its outline was more defined. 
This was clearly the shape of a person. I could see shoulders and arms and long hair. This was the shadow of a woman. It didn't move. Paul? I asked. Where's Margaret? He didn't understand. The nurse who just came in here? I clarified. Oh, he said. Well, my song ended. And after I finish my song, she always gets a little hungry. Hungry? What the hell did he mean? I knew he was talking about the shadow, or whatever it was he saw in the corner. How could a shadow be hungry? And where was Margaret? I could see his face now, completely blank. I looked around the room, but there was no sign that Margaret had been there at all. Everything was empty and sterile. That is, until I noticed something on the floor just in front of that shadow. It was a single shoe. A nurse's shoe. Margaret's shoe. And the shadow shifted again, as if it was leaning back against the wall. Then a single sound came out of that shadow. One that I'll remember for the rest of my life. It was a burp. Yo! Jose! The night's tranquil atmosphere was interrupted by the shrill call. The caller was familiar. The man who called marched briskly from the dark corridors of the storehouse into the light. His features were indistinct, but the shaky note of his alarm had been enough to stop me in my tracks. I flushed upon recognition. I smiled. He did not. My disposition changed to mirror his demeanor. There was a briskness to his stride, all too alert to not have been deliberate. The smile on my face waned as his strange manners continued. I recognized the discomfort on the man's face as soon as he came to the light. It was a scowl that did not reveal irritation, but concern. Deep concern. I turned from my sideways stance to face him. What's up, man? I asked, puzzled. Some funny shit's going on. He gulped anxiously. He licked his lips and paused to confirm I was attentive to what he was saying. I was just looking at my post when I saw something strange. Something's not right tonight. A thief? My heart sank. It was for this reason that I had always hated the night shift. During the day, there were very few thieving people to deal with. Even though incidents like these happened during the day, they were scarce and far in between. I sighed as the heat of my body burned at this news. Malcolm, for that was the name of my black colleague who was in front of me, stirred quickly and looked over his shoulder. I looked in the same direction. I hate these types of nights, man, I lamented coolly. Hell no, Malcolm fumed. I don't want to have to deal with any of the crazies. Crazies, I recoiled. I think he's armed with a pickaxe. I could make that out before I ducked away, Malcolm revealed. My heart bumped against my chest painfully, snatching my breath. What type of f***er walked the night with a pickaxe? An awry feeling swept through the atmosphere, and even though I had not seen the threat, I maintained a healthy sense of dread. We should call the cops, I moaned, quivering as I spoke. Malcolm assessed me briefly with a scowl and furrowed brows. There was a choice to be made. It was company policy that the guards should never work at night with cell phones because it could distract them from the work they were employed to do. There was only one telephone in the storehouse. The trouble was to decide who would go get it. Malcolm did not seem interested. Whatever he had seen had shaken him terribly. His eyes were white as snow and his respiration was inconsistent. I had the feeling that the man wanted nothing more than to leave. Malcolm's horror corrupted me, and my fear of the unknown axe carrier was heightened. I have a daughter. I can't get hacked by some deranged fucker with a pickaxe, Malcolm revealed. And as he spoke, his eyes drifted to the dark corner from where he had just emerged. Again, my gaze was directed by Malcolm's, and our world suddenly fell quiet. The mixture of darkness and the sudden silence was a potent omen of something terrible. The air was palpably thicker, 
and it took effort to rally oxygen into the lungs. Pressure made my vision blurry. I peered into the formless black area and my heart spasmed violently. Someone was there in the blackness, taunting us. I could make out the aspect in the darkness when I squinted. The delay to emerge was deliberate, calculated to allow us to shiver in fear. In some way, I considered it thrilling, or I would have run as quickly as my feet could carry me from the danger. Hey, come out into the light right now, I demanded as I stepped forward carefully. Malcolm did not move, and I could tell from his shaky breath that he would not move. The noise of metal scraping against the floor defiantly, rebelling my order, made my blood run cold in my body. The feeling of my confidence so crudely snatched made me stagger steps backwards. Then he heard the footsteps marching forward heavily. I realized my folly. I was unarmed and I stood a slim chance against someone or something, for I did not know which it was with such a vicious tool. My confidence in Malcolm had been misguided, and I had been only made to realize it when it was too late. He held his breath and bid the moment of revelation with a foggy mind. Time crept slowly, painfully slowly, and I struggled to reconcile my audacity in the face of potent danger. As soon as the man appeared, my world spun. The man's physique was athletic, with a well-proportioned form that caught my attention. His heavy chest was like massive balloons from how huge they were. His superhuman mass of muscle was distracting, taking my focus from the tool which he bore in his hand. He did not speak, but I had already mentally created a bass tone for his voice. I don't know what you want, man! I chugged pale from horror. I looked to my side, and Malcolm peeled away farther from the confrontation. Just walk away, man. This is private property. The man swung the pickaxe from the floor and pointed his finger at me. Instinctively, I looked at the finger, and I was hypnotized. The man started to make his way towards Malcolm with his finger pointed out, and I could do nothing. Shit! Malcolm blurted, and in the same motion bolted into the night. I froze in fear, paralyzed by a force stronger than my instinct to flee. I called to my feet, but it failed me, and I was like one fixed to the spot. My knees wobbled, and my entire body trembled with matching violence as the man's pace increased. My eyes drifted to the pickaxe, and I swallowed, registering what I knew was certain death. Stop right there, man! I cried, watching my whole life slowly slip into nothingness. I paled white and my temperature fell to a defeating chill. It was fear like I had never known which made me numb. Who are you? What do you want? The man would not say, and there was no way to know. I sensed my breathing slowly failing, and in a strange way, as time moved slower, the events were happening faster. The man did not blink as he marched, driven by the lust to kill. When he was an arm away from me, he stopped and put his finger down. With both hands, he gripped the handle of his pickaxe and heaved it backwards with no effort. No! I cried and suddenly broke out of the freeze. I swung my body against the man as the pickaxe reeled forward. My intervention broke his motion. He visibly got irritated by this and struck his arm out against my face ferociously. I crashed to the floor, vulnerable to attack. The man jumped on the chance and lifted his pickaxe behind his head. I closed my eyes and expected a quick death. The glint in the man's eyes were as white as the moon, emotionless and without known intent. He was like a difficult machine to stop and all I could do in my surrender was put my hands out and carve my mouth to utter a plea for mercy. I fought against the bitter taste of death and wondered why I must die that way. Yet, I surrendered without question. Die, you crazy guy! Malcolm blurted as loud as the gunshot which rang in the air. As the steel hook of the axe hit the ground with a loud clang behind him, the man fell in a heap on the floor. 
I watched for a few moments as though I had been in a terrible dream. When I confirmed my reality, I quickly sprung up, my body tensing with adrenaline, and I turned to confront Malcolm. Is he dead? I asked breathlessly. It's a headshot, Malcolm answered. This is why I always keep a sticky in the bag. 